Please join me in welcoming Dr. Adam Fincham. Welcome, Adam. Thanks so much for joining us. Well, thank you, Jennifer. Thanks for having this opportunity to, to uh, uh, present some of the work we've been doing with our group. And um, I'm really excited about it. And, and so, uh, yeah, again, it's a, really my pleasure to be here. From the very beginning, when I got involved with this project, we looked at it as a journey and none of us really knew where the journey was going to go. And so what I'm going to try to do today is give a little bit of insight into that journey, some of the steps along the way. I'll go through in some rough order, the vision, the science, the innovation, engineering, integration, implementation, and ultimately the perfect wave. And here's just a little few statistics about you know, Kelly and and uh, you know, he's really an iconic uh, sports figure in the surfing world, um, sort of the, you know, the greatest of all time, uh, undisputedly. And um, I think it was really that the success of what we've done was uh, largely attributed to having such an iconic figure um, associated with the, with the desire and vision that was, was put together um, you know, along with our team. And, and it really... Um, would have been quite difficult otherwise. So um, we put together a group of people and um, businessmen, surfers, engineers, scientists, and we formed a, back, a, I don't know, 2006, 2007, probably, maybe 2008, uh, what is today called the Kelly Slater Work Wave Company. Um, a little bit about the vision of the company. The company had a primary objective. It was very clear that what they wanted to do was to produce a world-class barreling wave. We had to be able to control all aspects of the wave's character. And part of the objective there was really to not just produce this single barreling wave, but also become experts in the field of artificial wave systems and surf science. And we also wanted to make sure that whatever we developed could be robust, simple, and deployable in, in a variety of situations. And these were sort of the, the mission of the, of the Kelly Slater Wave Company when it was formed. Um, so what is the perfect wave? Well, in, in waves, you have sort of a, three phases, uh, I like to say. You have the sort of generation of the wave um, where, where it may be generated by whatever means it may be, be it a storm in the ocean or a, or a landslide or some other mechanical man-made event. Um, and then the wave propagates away from where it's generated and eventually it will either you know, pitter away or if it does come across anywhere where there's uh, sufficiently shallow water or a shoreline, it can break. And uh, our objective for uh, surfing is obviously to generate waves that are breaking in a very particular way. And we would like them to emulate as best as possible the swells typically found in the ocean, um, the type that surfers enjoy. And if we can, in addition, control things like the speed and angle, severity of the wave, of the break of the wave, uh, this, this is uh, starting to be very interesting um, as an objective, and it's it's quite a, a big objective. It's uh, uh, initially this was a little bit overwhelming to think that we would uh, be able to do all of this. Um, you'd also like to be able to control the variability of the wave as it moves forward, and you want to do all of this in a reasonably energy efficient way, and without uh, you want to minimize the complexity of the equipment um, that is required to do this. So we took a very formal scientific approach. Um, initially, we, we really were just looking at all the prior works. We put together a strong team that was you know, balanced in the different uh, fields that are necessary for this type of project. Uh, I'll talk about it in the next slide. And uh, we realized that we were probably gonna have to do reduced scale laboratory model, modeling and um, probably some computations, and really we're trying to get a grip on the physics of the controlling parameters. So I put this little slide together here, 
just to show the sort of five pillars of, of what we do. And uh, they're not in any particular order, but uh, in the center, we have sort of analytical methods where we try to do what little math we can and, and uh, try, to, try to get some ideas from fundamental wave theory. And then, uh, you know, once we have some ideas that, we, that look good on paper, we want to either run them through a computer with a computational fluid dynamics model or potentially uh, through a laboratory physical model. And um, then there's, uh, you know, obviously other parts is uh, when you want to implement this for real, you have to look at the engineering issues. And ultimately, if you're lucky enough to be able to have such a wave, uh, you want to make measurements of the actual wave and loop it back in to say, well, how well did that agree with my initial analytics and laboratory modeling and computation engineering? You know, how, how good a job did I do and what can I improve things? How can I improve things to do better next time? So we went through the existing knowledge of uh, various patents and, you know, other experimental works, mainly pulling from work done in universities for generating waves in large flumes for engineering studies. Um, and uh, we looked at other attempts to create surfing waves and what they had done and what had worked or what was there. So we, we obviously didn't want to reinvent the wheel and we, we made sure that what we were doing was gonna be, uh, I guess in that sense, it, it, we knew that we were onto something unique because we hadn't seen anything done quite the way we were eventually decided to do it. Clearly in a project like this, we needed a lot of collaboration. So we, um, you know, we, we picked uh, engineers and scientists from a variety of institutes who helped us in the early days to conceive uh, different ideas and, and really um, to put a second set of eyes on everything we're doing to make sure we weren't uh, running amok somewhere. And there's a vast number of people involved over the years here, and this clearly I can't remember all of them. But we started with a pilot study, and the pilot study was a physical modeling study done in a linear flume. And throughout this study, we were able to verify um, some basic dependencies of the waves that we were able to generate. And it was a uh, important for us at that point to kind of get a little bit used to the concept of what a uh, generated wave would do on different beach profiles. Um, we wanted to know how things like the speed and the depth and the, the size of the wave, and the height of the wave, the length of the wave, how all of those um, played a part in the way it propagated, the way it barreled and what eventually happened. And this was all done in a very small little scale model where the wave itself was just a few inches tall. But this pilot study convinced us that the methods we'd chosen were probably capable of producing something that would be close to the wave that, that Kelly wanted. And uh, the method we had chosen um, here for the pilot study was to use what we call a hydrofoil. So the hydrofoil here is really uh, a hydromechanically shaped object, which probably the best way to describe it would be if you took the wing of an airplane and you sliced it up like a loaf of bread and you took one of those slices and turned it on its side and ran it through the water. That would sort of be the, the, what these hydrofoils look like. And you'll, you'll get a better picture of them as we go forward here. But what we were looking at was that rather than trying to have a complex arrays of devices that would stimulate the water in different, uh, along a, a length, we thought that if we had the right hydrofoil, we would just have to pull it through the water um, along a track of some sort, and it should be able to generate a swell uh, of any form we, we like uh, based on how we designed the hydrofoil. And one of the issues here was that we, 
wanted the wave to peel back uh, away from the hydrofoil. This sort of peeling effect is what allows surface to ride waves for long periods of time versus a wave coming parallel to the beach will, will close out and you won't have a, a long ride. And so this required us to be in what we call a, a higher fruit number regime where the speed of the movement of the wave, uh, or in this case, the movement of the hydrofoil is higher than the natural speed that the wave itself would propagate at. This um, concept um, was proven quite well in the laboratory scale. And we used various sensors. We had a, a acoustic gauges that would pick up the surface of the water. We had other um, laser diagnostics measuring velocities and turbulence within the fluid and visualization from cameras and such. And uh, ultimately uh, went on a little bit further to do some crude numerical models just to make sure that what we had was, was an agreement with basic theory. But we, we found that our method was sufficiently sound um, to, to go to the next level. And what we then did was we reshaped our hydrofoils specifically to generate a type of wave that we thought would be appropriate to producing the type of swell that would break in a way that surfers tend to like. And this uh, type of wave is called a solitary wave. And it's a very discovered many years ago. Um, and it's not specific to say that we had to use this particular form of solitary wave, but we thought this was a good place to start. And uh, the solitary waves have very unique properties and these properties seem to fit with the desire and, and uh, you know, requirements of what we're trying to do. So in uh, laboratory testing, we found immediately upon designing a hydrofoil specifically to generate a solitary wave that we were able to obtain much higher wave amplitudes, bigger waves for the same depth of fluid and other parameters. So this was immediately a benefit and we were quite excited about this. And hence um, going forward, we stuck with the, the solitary wave approach um, for our wave generation methods. And uh, this is what we have implemented at full scale. If we designed a hydrofoil that it moved the water and imparted a force, a, a displacement on the water that was natural to what a typical solitary wave under those conditions would do, we could arrive at very efficient transfer of energy between our hydrofoils and the generated swell. So the analogy here would be to think that if you throw a stone into a pool, eventually little waves come out from where the stone hit and um, they, they continue to move. But what happens when the stone impacts the water, there is a large area of turbulence and splash. And eventually when that calms down, it, it forms into these waves that then propagate away. And we were interested in trying to ensure that the waves would be generated um, efficiently as close to the hydrofoil as possible so we didn't waste space. And at the same time, they didn't get a chance to reorganize and uh, change their shape from what they were initially uh, designed to be shaped like. So this was the swell generation and the hydrofoil technique proved capable of generating solitary wave swells um, in the laboratory and uh, again in uh, the computational models, which I'll show. At this point, Kelly's dream had always been not only to have a perfect wave, but he wanted an infinite wave. He wanted a wave that would go on forever. Hence, our initial designs were all based on a circular donut-like structure where the hydrofoils would run around the outer perimeter and propagate the waves towards the central island. And hence we built a 13 meter diameter prototype 
you know, Culver City, Los Angeles, and uh, instrumented it uh, with a full scientific instrumentation, manufactured some different hydrofoils, and started to make much more detailed measurements at slightly larger scale. So now our wave is probably looking at about six inches tall as opposed to two inches tall. Um, this sort of scaling in this case was going to be approximately about a 15 to one. So a six inch wave in the lab would be 15 times bigger than that, which is sort of in the sort of six foot area, which was considered to be a wave that was sufficiently large that a nominal surfer could enter the barrel if you had one. At the same time, well, here we, what I'm showing here is uh, actual data taken from the laboratory where we incorporated a second hydrofoil on the annulus and were able to generate and sustain uh, two waves simultaneously. And this started to create issues where there was a lot of uh, currents and, and chop and turbulence that would start to degrade the waves. And uh, we spent quite a long period of time tackling these issues, trying to, um, trying to find uh, solutions to, to uh, the issues of turbulence, chop, uh, Lazy River was another one where you're going around in one direction and you eventually stir the water up. And uh, yeah, it was quite a difficult time um, as we were trying to perfect this never ending infinite circular wave. Um, again, we, we developed during this time a variety of intellectual property, including the hydrofoil wave generators. We, we looked at a wave cancellation gutters that we tested in, in the scale model and obviously the topography bathymetry that we were able to use to generate a, a clean shaped barrel. And um, we have uh, you know, dozens of patents issued uh, around this technology and its various applications. One of the biggest issues you have when you do reduced scale laboratory modeling is you have to know that you can scale this back up uh, to full size. And so one of the tools we used to validate the scaling was uh, computational fluid dynamics. And um, we also did some limited testing in some larger scale wave basins. And um, really we're looking to field data uh, to try to find uh, um, comparisons or validation and, and here it was quite a critical time because you didn't want to go ahead and build something um, unless you knew it was going to work. And so the, the computational fluid dynamics, we call CFD for short, um, done on high performance computing systems. And this allowed us to uh, simulate the physics in, under different loading conditions, scaling conditions. And uh, here were able to gain more data on the flow field than we can from the laboratory measurements. But we have to always remember it is a simulation and uh, is subject to, to uh, variation and errors and uh, the garbage in, garbage out effect. Um, during this time, we, using the computational models, found that there were ways that we could control the wave. And if you can see in these uh, two panels left and right here um, that show the same wave, one from the wave coming towards you at the top and just a sort of projection at the side. And the line that you can see uh, under the wave is really just a, a model bathymetry, um, i.e. The, the floor of the basin, and you have two radically different, uh, what you might call the reef here. And you can see that in the two cases, the wave is quite different. And uh, you know, on the, on the right with the much more shallow reef, the barrel is a bit more open, the lip pitches further forward. And in the one on the left, uh, where, where the wave kind of gets a bit tall, but it's very almondy. And so we were playing with different parameters, uh, understanding how well we could control these waves with the bathymetry 
um, and how, basically by breaking them in a peculiar manner once they're generated. Here's another example um, where, again, you can see from the top and the bottom where by adding this additional lithimetry bump here, we push the breaking point of the wave much further out, providing a lot more face of the wave. And uh, there's also some other subtleties that can be seen in these views. But the, the key here was you have the hydrofoil that makes a wave or makes a swell, and you propagate the swell over a bathymetry or reef, and then it breaks in a particular way. And the way the wave breaks depends on the shape of the hydrofoil, the depth of the water, the speed of the hydrofoil, and the shape of the, the floor, the bathymetry. So you have a lot of parameters to play with, and you, you have to... Um, Try to explore these in some sort of systematic way. Um, we did have uh, quite a few issues with what I'll call chop and sesh control. Um, basically, you when you make a wave in an enclosed basin, uh, you are going to have currents and small waves and reflections that are going to bounce around in the basin for a while until they dissipate and they prevent you from making another good wave uh, soon after. So you end up wanting to try to dissipate all the energy left behind the wave as soon as you can, so you can make another one. And um, so we work quite hard on this, in particular in the circular design. Uh, here are some other current dissipation techniques we use, little vortex generators that increase the turbulence and basically just dissipate dissipate energy and uh, reduce uh, azimuthal currents in this uh, circular. And we also ran some computations on these. Um, we had other current mitigation strategies where we tried to redirect the water that went up the beach in a direction against the mean motion of the flow, i.e. against the direction of the hydrofoil. And this was quite successful in allowing us to sustain the wave in the prototype system uh, indefinitely. So we now had we now had an infinite wave that was barreling in a beautiful way, except it was only six inches tall. Um, so at that point we we thought, well, okay, so the concept, the concept is completed um, in terms of we've we've got what we want. We understand it at the small scale, we've explored the different parameters that control it, and we were dabbling with what does it take to make this full size. Um, and uh, that's when we really had to start putting on a different hat now, and now we're putting on an engineering hat, and a lot of us in the company are you know, more scientists and uh, have not depend, you know, some of us had more experience than others, and we were now starting to get our feet wet into large scale engineering with the fundamental problem of how do you mechanize a large hydrofoil that turns out weighs, you know, upwards of a 300 tons uh, to travel through a water basin at a supercritical speed. I and mean, supercritical, I mean, at a speed faster than the natural wave speed of the wave that it's generating. Um, so this was a, a little bit uh, intimidating at first. And again, we had to reach out for, for partners and, and uh, we looked for leading engineering firms and, and uh, brought them together, looked at blue sky approaches to the engineering, again, shooting for simplicity and elegance, um, assembled a team of technical advisors. We wanted to try to use off the shelf components if we could and we wanted things to be validated with uh, engineering oversight by uh, specialized engineering firms. That was quite important. And at this point, we still had the circular design. And so we, we felt quite comfortable with the design. We'd done quite a bit of uh, work on it. We were running this on rubber tires, which seemed to work well. We'd worked with um, some very smart engineers. And uh, here's a little video just to show um, uh, one of our circular concepts, you know, this has evolved through many different concepts. Um, uh, but the idea here, you'd have the circular donut, the wave would go around. And so the, the mechanism to do this would look something like this. And you'd have a large hydrofoil in white there. 
that uh, rotates um, behind a, a safety fence to make sure that the mechanical components are not in any way um, uh, accessible to the people within the basin. And uh, this gives you some brief idea of the, the sort of mechanism. And it's not that complicated. You're really just got a hydrofoil. You have some kind of truss in this design. You got some motors. Um, you, you put that all together and then you put some water in there and uh, then you put on the safety fence and decking and turn it on. And didn't seem too much, but this is after a lot of thought and many, many variations. And we, we further evolved this, but nonetheless, it was uh, at that point, our company changed direction and they decided that it was going to be a linear design. So now, after all our work on circular, we're going for a linear system. So we had some little concepts of how would we do this in a linear way? Now, linear system meant you couldn't have an infinite wave. So at this point, our wave would no longer be infinite. It would be the perfect wave, but it would not run infinitely. You know, we're running down the length of a track in a rectangular basin. And then you'd, uh, for the first version, you'd have, then you'd have to back it up and then do it again. And uh, that was what we decided to do to prove at full scale that we could do this. And we went through many different mechanical design options, some pictures here that just show the different levels of complexity for the design mechanically. Um, and uh, eventually came up with something that we thought was uh, going to be simple enough and, and uh, appropriately budgeted to, to be built. Uh, this is a time probably in around 2013 where we went and purchased this piece of land in Lemoore, California, in the Central Valley that used to be an old uh, water skiing lake. And um, yeah, so now we were actually having a piece of land and about to try to build uh, a full-size prototype of uh, our wave um, wave system. Um, this was an exciting time, and um, but it was real. We, we ordered steel. We started moving dirt. We contracted with a, a variety of um, local um, shops in the area and uh, outside of the area to do some of the steel work. And, and uh, so this was now completely change from a science project to a full-scale construction project. We were fabricating um, different components um, in, uh, in different fabrication houses uh, around the country. Uh, here you can see the, his, uh, his actual hydrofoil full size, and, and you know, it's over 100 feet long kind of thing. And, and here it's not finished yet, but it's sort of like building a boat in some ways, a submarine. Um, so while all of this was going on, we were working with our partners in control systems and they were mocking up the control systems and in the various uh, factories where they work and validating, uh, all of the, the logic, um, uh, hydraulic systems and the later version that, that had to be tested on the bench and, and, um, integrated into our, our hydrofoil for the, for the second version here. There were, there were actually two or three versions of this. I'm not gonna have time to explain the differences. And then there was a winch system. We decided that the best way to move a hydrofoil through the water uh, along this track, and the track was about 700 meters long, um, was to pull it with a big winch. What could be simpler than that? Um, so the winch system was being commissioned and you can see how many people, this is just for the winch alone. This is the group in Canada that produce the winch for us. Um, and that's just the winch there without the motor. You're just looking at the raw winch. And uh, what a big team, you know, of, uh, of Canadians here who, who built this uh, first winch for us. Um, and then parts started to arrive on the site. And you can see on the left here, this is the motor, that uh, big yellow thing sticking up, the winch that seems to be under this. And this was really exciting. You know, here we are digging a hole in the dirt and uh, now machinery and transformers and things are arriving at the site. Um, there's Kelly uh, 
proudly standing in front of the, uh, the, the winch. Or one of the winches at this point. I think it's the first winch we had, yes. Um, meanwhile, there was concrete and steel going up, excavation. We had to build a track for the, for the hydrofoil, which can be seen here in the lower left. Had to run along a track. Um, ran with 120-odd truck tires to take the loads in all the different directions. Um, we had a concrete base under it to support. There's quite a lot of load on uh, this hydrofoil as it moves through the water because it is pushing up a giant wave on one side and um, hence uh, the force, it, lateral forces pushing it sideways are quite large. Uh, here's a closer up of the uh, hydrofoil as it's being placed. You can see the wheel structure above it. Um, some other concrete work going on here. Uh, Oh, this is, uh, yeah, just Kelly on the site here. Um, I like the picture on the right because you can see his OSHA compliant work boots um, as he stands on uh, that structure there. Um, yeah, other things, we had to set up communication systems to communicate with the moving hydrofoil. Uh, here you can see, and this is sort of a, what we call the version 1.1, I guess, instead of 1.0, we added this grading structure here, which still exists today, which um, is designed to, based on the phase cancellation gutters that we, we um, developed earlier in the circular, to cancel some of the wave energy as it hits and reduce reflections from that side. Um, then what's next? Well, when you've done all the construction, now you have to commission it. The commissioning is where you you want to test things and you put things together. You're trying to make it run. Uh, you don't want to break anything. You're super careful. You have all the engineers and technicians from the various partner companies that we're working with on site. And uh, it's a really exciting time, but you start slow. Um, here, oh, let me see if I can go back. Yeah, so uh, yeah, you, uh, you don't immediately crank it up to speed. And here's a little video. So this would be a, this is probably not commissioning, but this is typically commissioning. You're slowly moving things back and forward, at very slow speeds, just to make sure mechanically everything is, is working the way you want it to be. And then you continue to increase the speed uh, up until you get to operating speed where a wave is actually generated. This is a good thing. It lets you have a kind of view for those who haven't been to the surf ranch. It lets you see some of the mechanics associated with the, uh, the hydrofoil. Some people call it the train, heard it called a variety of things. And then when you get to the commissioning speed or the, uh, the functioning speed, so here's a video. You can see this structure right in the middle that's sticking up like a pole in the middle of the lake. This is a, a, what we call the rig, where we have a bunch of instruments that will measure the height of the wave and the velocity of the currents under the wave and the pressures and things like that. So it's a sort of little oceanographic rig that we put in the middle. So this is a, a wave uh, coming down and this is a, you know, what, uh, what we created. And um, it was very exciting at a, from the commissioning level, just to be able to, um, to see this. Prior to Kelly uh, actually surfing it, but this video is actually from what we call a 2.0. So it's a little bit, it's a later kind of rebuild of the surf ranch, but the principle is the same that we did. And the wave is very similar. raining that day too, you can see. So one of the things we do with this is once we have the full scale prototype, we'd love to compare it with the computations that we had to make sure, to see if we can adjust our computational models to do a better job. And so here's an overlay of an actual wave in, in, and I put the uh, ISO surface of the computationally generated wave 
on top of it. And uh, we can see that um, there's a reasonably good match in the wave shape and the lip, but there are some um, discrepancies in the splash up area because the computational methods have a hard time dealing with spray and splash. Well, then, um, yeah, we had the wave and uh, things were, um, you know, Kelly was happy with the wave. It got a lot of media attention. Um, in came the World Surf League and uh, uh, we were, the Kelly Seda Wave Company was taken over by uh, and integrated with the World Surf League. And uh, the site was uh, then dubbed the Surf Ranch and is, uh, um, here's a little surf ranch thing. You can see his pictures of the surf ranch and now hosts, uh, competitions, uh, every year and, um, and guests, uh, on almost a daily basis. And, uh, that was sort of it. And maybe I'll show this little video here of, uh, one of, um, his, uh, Philip Toledo in, uh, one of our events. Uh, this is the surf ranch pro from a couple of years ago, I'd imagine. And, and there's a windy day and you can see how rough the wave is and so on. But Felipe's uh, coming down this uh, wave and uh, has quite a spectacular ride. And I think our whole company and everyone involved is always happy to see the kind of stoke that this project has brought to so many people up there in the Central Valley of California. So, um, yeah, thank you again. And uh, I, I can't say enough uh, how fun this is and really would like to acknowledge uh, so many people who have been a big part of this project since the beginning and, and uh, others that I clearly uh, have forgotten to put here. But, uh, um, yeah, this is a project that's involved uh, hundreds of people. Thank you.